How you doing, horror hounds? I'm Michael Penning, writer of Pinup Dolls on Ice, and you are watching The Thirteenth Wolfman. Hey everybody, I'm the Thirteenth Wolfman. You know how with me today? I have Michael Penning. He is the screenwriter. He is an author. He worked on uh, Pinup Dolls on Ice. Welcome to sit down, Michael. How you doing, Wolfman? It's good to meet you, man. Thanks for having me on the show. Oh, dude, thanks for coming on. You know, I mean, I, I said before, you know, you're an author. You've written, you've written two books so far, All Hallows Eve. And, All Hallows uh, Eve is going to be the first in the series, and I'm about halfway through the second book. It's going to be the sequel to All Hallows Eve. Uh, neither of them's published yet. The first one's in the hands of my agent. It's been shopped around to uh, publishers. And uh, that, the, but the next one, I can't reveal anything about it yet, other than it takes place 20 years after the events of the first one. Okay, so I, I did. I I looked around and I I kind of found out what All Hallows Eve was about. Yeah, you know, I mean, can you talk about that at all? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's uh, it takes place in Salem, Massachusetts, a uh, hundred years after the witch trials, and there's a, a curse descending upon the town. And uh, the book is about a single mother who's uh, she has to fight these sort of the ghosts of the dead witches who come back and kidnap her only daughter. So it all takes place on the night of All Hallows' Eve when the dead are basically coming back to life in the town of Salem. When the veil between the living and the dead is it's, in its thinnest. Yeah, that's exactly. I mean, I'm a huge fan of Halloween, the, the holiday itself. And because this takes place in 1792, it's a period piece. So I was really able to sort of dive in and, and look at sort of the history of Halloween as a tradition and as a holiday and cultural significance and all the, sort of the origins of all these things that we kind of take for granted now. So they're all sort of worked into the storyline and they all sort of explode on this one night. Yeah, this, this is one of those things that, like I said, I found out about it. I, man, I, I want this book to, now you said it's in the hands of your, your literary agent, right? Yeah. Now. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So you want to get it published, you know, start getting on the back of your local publisher and start demanding to see it in print. <laughs> I want to read this because this was actually supposed to be a movie. It was. And it won, uh, it won a couple of awards as a screenplay. I mean, I wrote it probably about 10 years ago as, as a movie. And uh, I submitted it to a bunch of screenplay competitions. And it won. It was a, a finalist in the next great John Carpenter movie contest, which, you know, which means it got into his hands at some point. Uh, it won a prize in the American Screenwriters Association contest for screenwriting. Uh, because of that, it got passed around Hollywood to a bunch of people. And generally, the consensus I got from it was because it's a horror story, but it's also a period piece, the cost of it's just too much to make, but everybody loved the story. Yeah, so, I was going to say, I mean, being, being what, that was that, like, seven, being t taking place in like 1792. Was, yeah. You know, I mean, you could, you could do it. You could do yeah. it, and you know what? The stuff I'm seeing now on TV, it's 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 much more doable uh, on a smaller scale. I mean, you need the village, you need horses, you need costumes, but a lot of it you can do with CGI. I mean, what I'm seeing on Walking Dead and even the show Salem, right? A lot of it is uh, computer-generated background. So nowadays you could do it pretty well, but I've already turned it into a book. So <laughs> I, I, I've been wanting to see that show Salem, but they they. they uh, they uh, shot him. Oh, or not shot him, but they showed him out of. Out of uh, sequence? Out of sequence. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And so it completely ruins it for me. I don't want. When I watch episode one, I don't want to watch episode four next and then go back to three. You know? Oh, no, like, hell no. Exactly. I, have, I haven't even started that show yet. I do one at a time. And right now it's sort of, you know, I was just catching up to the end of the new Walking Dead season. So it was just concluded, right? So now I'm free to take off on something else. Uh, yeah, but yeah, I, I kind of avoided Salem also because I was worried I'd see too many similarities to my book and I'd be screwed. Uh, <laughs> you know, when, when I saw you know, Rob Zombie's Lords of, Lord of Salem, Lords of Salem was coming out, that made me nervous also. And then I watched it and I, I'm safe. It's got nothing to do with, with what I was doing. But yeah, actually, couple, I, I like, really like that movie. Back now, so. <laughs> I thought that movie was pretty decent. You know what? I liked it. Um, I mean, I'm a huge fan of everything he does. It's just because I like how he does what he wants. And that's not to say, you know, fuck everybody else and I'm going to do what I want regardless. I mean, you still have to take your audience into consideration. But uh, he sticks to his guns. He has his following. I like how he's not afraid to experiment 
and he doesn't always play it safe. It would have been very easy for him to keep doing Devil's Rejects and House of a Thousand Corpses, but he took on a movie that felt a lot more like Kubrick than anything else. It was really atmospheric. I think I got lost somewhere in the third act, like it kind of disintegrated into a bit of a music video near the end, but beautiful movie and a lot more sophisticated and complex than he's, he's done before. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I didn't care for House of a Thousand Corpses. I, 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 I remember seeing the trailer yeah. in the theaters, Uh huh. and they're like, in six months, this movie's coming out, and I thought, ooh, that looks nice and creepy, House of a Thousand Corpses, and then it didn't come out for three years. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I remember hearing about that. I mean, I was a white zombie fan, and I remember hearing about it, and I was like, this is going to be sick. If anybody knows about horror, it's Rob Zombie. This movie's going to kill everything. I saw the trailer for it, and it had that really creepy shot of, like, these wooden crosses. Yeah. Like, this is going to rock. Just the title, House of a Thousand Corpses, has that exactly. classic feel to it. And, and, and then, and then yeah. it turns into an hour-and-a-half rock video. Yeah, yeah. That's and all wonder, it was. yeah. I wonder if there's a, a like a director's cut floating around. I know it got screwed over between the different studios and Universal I had a say in it and stuff. I wonder if there's like the ultra violent version floating around, if it was really that sort of you know oversaturated I, I, eye candy. Yeah, see, I, I think that's what it was. I think Rob, since Rob Zombie was doing like all his music videos, and that's what it really felt like. It's like he's just said, "Oh, I make my own music videos. Those are three minute movies. I could just you know expand it for like you know." 87 minutes. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, yeah. and that's, I mean, I wanted that story. I wanted the one about the, the kids that go on the road and and check out all the different yeah. uh, sideshow, you know, things. Yeah, yeah. That was only like the first, what, 10 minutes? And then yeah. after that, and I don't know, I just... It stalls. Once they get to the house, it totally stalls. It just, it loses its momentum. Yeah, it's yeah. a good setup at first. I thought Captain Spaulding was a great character right from the get-go, and then... You know, like you said, once we kind of meet our mains, it, it, it sort of stalls after that. Um, and then he then he just completely forgot about the first... I, honestly, when he made Devil's Rejects, he, he said, okay, I've got a couple rich characters, Spalding, Otis, Baby. Yeah. Let's see what I could do with them. And, you know, and he made a great film. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, I still think that's his... I mean, I'm, I'm psyched for 31, the one he's working on now. 31 looks pretty good. Yeah, I mean, but Devil's Rejects, I think it's like that's his calling. That's his thing. That's an ugly, mean movie. It's I needed to show nobody likable at time. all. You know, I yeah. felt so dirty after watching the first time. I'm like, dude, I need a shower. This yeah, yeah. I shouldn't like this movie, but I do. Yeah, it's kind of like the original. I spit on your grave. I love that movie, but I yeah. shouldn't. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know? But you're not sitting down and watching it every Saturday night. <laughs> uh, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> No, I mean, you know, I mean, I remember being, I don't know, man, like, you know, pre-teen walking through the VHS store and seeing the, the, the VHS cover for I Spit on Your Grave, and it was just that girl's ass, and I was like yeah. horror fanatic, and I was like, okay, I got to check this movie out, and I never did until I was like in my late teens, and then I was like, wow, that's not what I expected at all. This is like before internet, before you could just read about everything, all the notoriety and stuff. I was just going by literally just judging the cover. And I was like, that looks like a cool slasher movie. It, it, and uh, the cover was nothing more than the poster art, and the poster art was wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Because they, they claim that she burned, chopped, and mutilated five guys. Yeah. And there's only four. <laughs> I never picked up on that. But now that you mentioned, I can see it exactly. I've got it right in my head. And it's, yeah, you're completely right. <laughs> <laughs> I just wonder that movie. Yeah. But. yeah. So you're so, a fan of that movie? Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah, it, it's. I mean, I don't know. I saw that. What was I like? Fifteen when when I saw it for the first time. I think it was like the early '80s. Okay. You know, so I mean, cable. We just got in cable, and you know, there were movies like uh, My Bloody Valentine and yeah. I Spit on Your Grave and The Fan. I've ne the Fan finally came out like on Blu-ray. Okay. And I'm not talking about the Robert De Niro movie. I'm talking yeah, about Yeah, I was like, that's we're probably not talking about two yeah. No, no, it's 1982. Uh, it's a 1982 real creepy stalker film. Okay. That, that's that been like sitting on someone's show for the last 30 years. They sure, finally yeah. It. I mean, I got to check it out now. Yeah. Yeah. So you were saying you're a white zombie fan, but you were also yeah. in a metal band. I was in a metal band for all of my teenage years and most of my 20s. Yeah, I played bass and wrote most of the lyrics. 
Yeah, we were like a, a cross between like Tool and Rage Against the Machine and Alice in Chains all kind of mushed together. What, what, what's with all the bass players like having all the talent? It's, you know what, if you play bass, you need something else to get attention. You know, like nobody digs the bass player. So you got to have something else that sticks out. You know, like Motley Crue and Nikki Six, try to pick out a bass line from any Motley Crue song and it's hidden so far down in the mix. So, yeah, yeah, but I mean, you know, other than Flea, you know, Chili Peppers, you don't, nobody rocks out to a bass solo, right? So it's not the sexiest instrument. So, yeah, I think a lot of bassists try to like compensate by doing more of the stuff, you know, like, okay, well, I'll write the lyrics also. <laughs> yeah, because I mean, Nikki Six was one I was thinking of. I mean, he's, he's written like 99% of the music and, and words for All Motley Crew. Getty Lee from Rush. Oh, I'm yeah. Not a, I'm not a big Rush fan myself. Neither, but, but yeah, he's, you know. But, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, what's his name? The guy from Skid Row. He was, uh, yeah, I'm a big Rachel 80s Bowen. fan. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, he wrote most of their stuff. Yeah. yeah. It seemed like, yeah, bassist in the 80s and 90s did a lot of the, the grunt work, I think. So, yeah, that's what I did. I played, you know, bass in the metal band. Uh, we played a lot in my hometown of Montreal. I played a lot of clubs and shows opening up for other uh, and then, you know, it wasn't paying the bills, the band breaks up, and I started doing uh, some more electronic stuff, some digital composition, and um, from there I decided, you know, it would be fun, because I was a big movie fan, I said it would be cool to, to score a movie, and I didn't know who was going to hire me to score a movie, but I had two friends who were, were starting out in filmmaking, end up being Jeff Klein, who directed um, Pin Up Dolls and Bikini Girls, <laughs> and uh, my other buddy, Jeff, John Deacher. And they were making short films. I said, guys, let's, uh, let's do a movie. I want to do some music for it. And they said, that's cool, but we don't have a movie to make. And I said, okay, well, I'll write a movie. You guys shoot it. I'll do the music for it. And then we're all happy. And that's exactly what we did. The uh, movie never came out. We didn't use the music I wrote for it. We got somebody else to write the music. But since then, we just discovered how much we just love making movies, period. I went on to keep concentrating on writing because that's what I'm better at. Uh, Jeff obviously has been plugging away at directing and John's directing movies too. So it's, it's been 15 years now since, since we started. Oh, wow. That's, that's great. So yeah. when, when, when you hooked up with Jeff for pinup dolls, yeah, did he come to you with an outline saying, here's the basic premise and then just let you run with it? Or did he give you a full outline of kind of like what he wanted? No, pinup dolls was it. Pinup dolls is a fun experience. I wasn't involved at all. Um, with, with Bikini Girls, before Pinup Dolls, I got an email from Jeff. I was working on something else, and I got an email from Jeff, and he said, I got this idea for a, a movie I want to do. Um, it's called Bikini Girls on Ice. And I was just like, I mean, the thing with Jeff, at the time, he was notorious for liking bad movies. Like, he had this VHS collection of the most obscure stuff, the entire trauma collection. Um, oh. So... Yeah, exactly. And I mean, great stuff, fun stuff. But yeah. when he started pitching the idea of Bikini Girls on Ice, my first reaction was, dude, what are you doing? And then literally five seconds later, I went, this is so crazy. It might be awesome. So he really wanted to write Bikini Girls. So he started having to go at that. But he was sort of shaky on how to go about doing it. So we would meet at my apartment, sit around and have some beers and he would be every couple of weeks and he would be putting out the new ideas for Bikini Girls and I would sort of poke holes in things until he got his script. And then he had the success with Bikini Girls and decided to keep going and do pinup dolls. Um, and at the time I wasn't involved at all. He, he'd got, he'd, he didn't want to write anymore. He really wanted to concentrate on producing and directing. Um, so, but he'd gotten other people to write some drafts of a script and it wasn't even, it wasn't called pinup dolls or anything yet. It was really just sort of on ice too. And he had one that he was thinking about, but I think he, he was a little bit anxious about it anyway. So he said, Mike, can you give me a, take, give a read. Let me know what you think. And I was sitting in a campground. I was camping with my wife when I was reading the first draft and it just wasn't clicking. It didn't feel like the, the sort of throwback, you know, vibe that should have. And it didn't feel like the writer understood what Mo should be. So I went back and I said, okay, Jeff, you can't make this movie. I said, I'm going to write something for you. Give me one month. I'll write something for you. I just want to write something anyways. If you like it, great. And if not, no hard feelings, go to something else, but just give me a month. 
And within that month, that's when I put together the first draft of Pin Up Dolls. I finished it by Halloween of that year and then submitted it. By that time, he brought Mel on to, to co-produce and I submitted it to them. And by Christmas, we had the final draft for it. They loved it. And that's where we went for that. We, we got a chance to watch it um, when we first interviewed Jeff and Melissa. Yeah. And I loved it, man. Good. Thank you. I appreciate you know. that. Uh you want to you you want to show a trailer? I'd love to, man. Let's give some people some eye candy here. Okay, so you want to introduce it? Sure. All right, world. Here is the trailer for Pin Up Dolls on Ice. Enjoy. You have any news? Oh, I know he's a big son of a bitch. He likes his girls frozen or on ice or something fucked up. When you see the pinups, tell them I say hello. You see anything, and I mean anything. Oh, you call me person, understand? We'll be fine, don't worry about it. Now, that's a great trailer. Yeah. Thank you. I, you know what? When I first saw that, it blew my skull off. I mean, you know, I, I saw rough cuts of, of everything without music, and I saw that, and I would, I, that's what I kind of felt. Okay, this, this movie might be going somewhere. So I'm glad you liked it, guys. Yeah, I, I really like the original. And that's, you know, I've told this story before. It's like how I met Jeff. Um, I got a chance to review the original for my channel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And next thing you know, I... Jeff's like, dude, thank you for, you know, he found out that I reviewed it and we exchanged emails. And so we're, we're internet friends now, basically. <laughs> yeah. 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 I guarantee I read that review. I read when, when they sat me down and said, okay, well, you know, I gave them the, the first draft that I wanted to do. And they said, okay, that's, you're hired. Let's go with it. Um, we'll keep going on more drafts. And they, they plunked me down with literally a stack of every review written with, highlighted all over the place and some of the highlights were for what was good about it and some of the highlights a lot of it was what was wrong with bikini girls yeah. and they said let's let's fix this and not to say that let's kowtow to everything that everybody said there were certain things that jeff and mel definitely wanted to stick to their guns with but a lot of it was stuff if we can fix it let's fix it so that's that's i guarantee at some point i would have read that review so i'm that would have been one of the ones where it's like okay we're doing something right let's keep doing that yeah so, oh, um, yeah, yeah, I lost my train of thought for a second. Sorry. Oh, <laughs> so, so yeah, uh, with Pit Up Dolls on Ice, do yeah. you have any idea what the third one's going to be? I do. I can't reveal anything. Um, I can't, I mean, it's not going to be called On Ice 3. It'll have its own standalone yeah. name. Um, I think we're going to keep going with the atmosphere of the second one. There's, there's a huge jump between Bikini Girls and Pinup Dolls. Bikini Girls really feels like it's, it's a fun ride and it feels kind of safe. Um, and it really feels more of the, the, the throwback to the, the real 80s slashers where you didn't really see a lot. It was a lot of stock and slash. And then for Pinup Dolls, it gets mean and it's, you know, it's, it's a dirty, ugly movie. Um, and we start off safe enough and then there's the, the shit hits the fan and all of a sudden you start going, Oh, uh, this isn't what I expected. This isn't the fun romp. And I think the, the, the next movie is going to continue that atmosphere. Um, what I can reveal is that we're, we're going to be setting up some storylines in the third one that might carry over into future movies as well. So they'll be, we'll be creating characters that we might be developing more over time and a little bit more of a, a through storyline that might cross over into a few more movies rather than just having the standalone movies that we've had so far. So we might get like a crazy Ralph from Friday the 13th? You might. <laughs> uh, it, I, th I think it might be a little bit more of the, the mains might, might carry over. Yeah, we tend to kill off the secondaries pretty quickly. You remember Crazy Ralph? Absolutely, yeah. It's a death curse. Yeah, absolutely. So being a, being an author, yeah. you, you got to have at least a favorite author. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's 
I, there's a bunch that I like, and it, it'll depend on on sort of the mood I'm in. Um, you know what? It sucks. It's a cliche. I love Stephen King. It's no, no, you know, no. it, it's hard not to be a horror writer and not love Stephen King, and you try to be a bit more original. But I mean, the guy is awesome. You know, and he's got his hits and misses. Some of the stuff I've read is really not good at all. But when he's been good, it's really good. When he's on, he's on, yeah. Yeah, I, I'm reading his son's stuff right now. Have you read Joe Hill's stuff? Yeah, he did. Um, I, I've only seen the one book. Uh, what was it? Well, he wrote he wrote Horns, right? And there's the movie with Daniel Radcliffe. Right, I saw uh, that movie. Yeah. yeah, see, I haven't seen the movie. I haven't read the book yet. I'm reading his oh. first book, Heart Shaped Box. That's what it was, yeah. It's awesome. Man, this guy can write. So, yeah, runs in the family. He's been trained well. So, yeah, I mean, I got, I got favorite writers. Um, it's, it's funny because I'm a horror writer, but in terms of novels, I like fluff. Like, I really like just sort of thrillers. Um, I like Douglas Preston and Lincoln Child stuff. I think they're really good. Dan Simmons is a great writer. If you ever read Carrie and Comfort, it's a huge book. But man, it, it's disturbing as hell. Basically, it's like the, the original story of people being able to invade. It's like mind vampires. They can invade oh, your cool. mind and make you do things you don't want to do, but you're completely conscious of it happening. And there's a scene that takes place in World War II where this Nazi colonel um, has this power and he's fighting against another guy in his own troop and they're playing a game of chess with the Jews. And essentially, they move them across the chessboard, and every time a piece gets taken off the board, they get shot and killed in different ways. And as you're reading it, it just unfolds and unfolds, but you're seeing it through the eyes of one of the Jews. So you really get the sense of this inevitability. Man, it was a tough read. He's a really good writer. Yeah, I just picked up the first two books uh, by the young lady that wrote uh, Gone Girl. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's sharp, a sharp objects sense. and... Uh, yeah. Yeah, and I, I, have you gotten into them yet? I I haven't I haven't started breaking them open, but I just picked them up because they were okay. there was a store going there was actually a store going out of business. And I'm like, hey, I can get these for like sixty percent off, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, but cool. Yeah, but, uh, no, there's a lot far, of good stuff happening. Yeah, yeah. As far as classic writers, though, I mean, my favorite all time favorite is is a uh, you know John, God Jack London. Oh Man, yeah. Don't know yeah. why I'm brain farting right now. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. What was uh, the book Call of the Wild. Wolves? Call of the Wild. Call of the Wild. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I don't know why I was brain farting either, man. I'm, I'm an outdoor guy. Like I go camping and hiking and mountaineering all the time. So that's you know that's that's definitely essential reading if you're, you know, yeah. an outdoorsy person. That's a great book. I mean, yeah, classics. I love Hemingway. That's. I mean, I have a literature degree. I studied all the classics and stuff. Uh, my oh, writing style is nothing like it. For whom the bell tolls. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, and Edgar Allan Poe is one of my favorites also, you know. So it's, like I said, it's you, you'd love to have more obscure names and feel a bit more original. But, I mean, these guys are, you know, they invented what we do. So, yeah, you know. I, I mean, you you, you want to have, yeah, you, you want to say, oh, yeah, I, I loved, uh, you know, the guy, that uh, Joseph Keller, you know, the guy that mm -hmm. wrote Catch-22. Yeah, you know, yeah. Or Harper. Harper Lee, who only ever wrote one book. Yeah. To Kill a Mockingbird. She just released a second book. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Apparently it's been sitting, you know, she, she's been writing ever since. She just keeps it to herself. Yeah. I think that's the craziest thing. I mean, I don't understand how you could, I mean, I love writing, so I, I understand the joy of sitting and typing and writing and inventing. But at some point, you want people to read it. It's, it's, a, it's a, too much of a solitary thing not to share. So it's a it's a strange you know yeah, psychology. It, it, I I think it has to go hand in hand with you know at the time you know it's like here's Harper Lee she writes like the biggest book of the fifties. Yeah. You know it now gets turned into like the biggest movie of the of the sixties, and she's getting all this attention and it's um it's not that she doesn't want the attention she just wants to write. Yeah. Yeah. You know. So You're hey, let's right. go. Let's go into you know solidarity and yeah. She reemerges fifty years later, or fifty or sixty years later, into a time where nobody has any privacy anymore. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, I guess you're right too. I mean, some people don't don't deal with 
celebrity very well, right? We don't need to look at, uh, you know, the grunge guys for that. You Kurt Cobain, I mean, that's that's your hometown, man, you know? So I'm a huge grunge fan, by the way. Like that, oh, dude. You know? I, so. I, loved, I, I loved the 90s grunge um, with the exception of Nirvana. Yeah. You know what? I liked Nirvana, um, but they were my least favorite. I mean, I'm Pearl Jam, Soundgarden, Alice in Chains guy. I wrote a movie called Long Gone Day, which is it's it's hasn't been released yet. It's done a few film festivals. They're working on distribution right now. It's not a horror movie at all. It's a it's a drama, but I based it on what I sort of envisioned as the last year of Lane Staley's life. Like Lane Staley, the the singer of Alice Lane in Chains, who yeah. OD'd on heroin, but nobody had seen him for a year. So I sort of I heard that and I got inspired to say, okay, well, what would be happening to this guy who sort of holds himself up into his loft? and disappears and does heroin for a year. So this is the, the sort of fictional st story of that. Um, I mean, not a happy movie at all. There's, there's love story involved in it. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, that just grew out of listening. Yeah, that was, that's one of the deaths that really ticked me off. Yeah. Because Lane Staley, I mean, I, I saw them, uh, God, I saw them at Rock Candy in Seattle. Okay. Before they were nobody, before they were anybody, you know. I mean, I got to see honestly. I got to see them all in Seattle before anyone knew who they were. Yeah. A lot of the bands, and um, I just I fell in love. I I fall in love with voices. Mm. You know, when I like music, if if you got a good voice, then I I just you not know, like he has one of these great voices, and it's just he we were robbed. Yeah. Because and I hate to say, it, but he was weak. Oh yeah. You yeah. know. Yeah, yeah. You can read his last interview. It's out online now. He did an interview with a Brazilian magazine when basically he'd isolated himself and he knew he was dying. And he said, I don't want to talk to my bandmates. They're not really my friends. And he knew what he was doing to himself. I think his teeth were falling out at the time. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a sad, but I mean, imagine the mindset of knowing this enough to be able to talk about it in an interview with a person in another continent. And yet you're right, you know, like not either wanting to do anything about it or being able to do anything about it. Yeah. It's uh yeah, it's a, it's a weird, um, you know, state of being, you know? Yeah. My, my cousin was in a lot of bands back, back then in the eighties and the nineties. The so it's like when he wasn't playing, he was hanging out with, he knew Stone Gossard mm. from high school. Oh man. Well, I guess it, it must be a smallish scene, right? Like back then. I'm sure everybody knew everybody, right? Well, I mean, yes and no. I mean, I, I mean, if they if they played in Seattle, I guess, yeah. But I mean, yeah. you're talking about guys like, you know, th that are from, you know, distancing areas that aren't right in Seattle. Right. So it's kind yeah. of, you know, I mean, the guys from Nirvana were from were from uh, Aberdeen, and that's it's Aberdeen, yeah, yeah, that's ways away from Seattle. <laughs> really? Oh, okay. Yeah. Nice, but. But yeah, I, God, I could sit here and talk music with you all day, man. <laughs> Maybe hey, we'll... I don't know if you're into beers at all. You guys have a really wicked beer scene happening out that way. Oh, I yeah? got out to the West Coast just to drink your guys' beer. I, I, I'm not a beer drinker. Um, uh, I, I mean, we have Rainier beer here. You know? <laughs> yeah, no, it's like if, if, yeah, I mean, you guys are like the epicenter of craft beer, you know, culture. Oh. Yeah, cool. like we got a lot going on the East Coast over here, a lot of good stuff happening in New England, but I got to get out your way to try some of the really good stuff you got happening. So what else you got coming out? I mean, you got the second book, you're you're yeah. got a movie, so, you know, that's going to be coming out. Yeah. Want anything else? Uh right now I'm going to be I want to finish the the first draft of the second novel by summertime. I'm heading to Europe for a couple months in the summertime. My wife and I are going to go climb some of the, the Swiss Alps. And then when we get back in September, uh, Jeff and Mel should have all their ideas together for On Ice 3. So I should be getting rolling on writing that in September. And ideally, we're going to have a first draft done by Christmas time. Um, yes. Yeah. And then after that, we'll begin the process of revising, revising, revising. But at least, usually once we get the rough draft done, they're able to start seeing it in their heads. And what we're doing is revising dialogue and revising some of the kill scenes around budget requirements. But they'll at least have a better idea of how they can start casting things and start getting locations. So that's what's coming up in the near future. Um, 
A lot of writing. I'm excited to get. I mean, I haven't written screenplay since Pinup Dolls. I really got back in or more into writing the the novels. So it'll be fun to, to get back into writing a screenplay because it's a completely different beast than writing a book. Yeah. yeah. Oh, no doubt. I mean, it's more of a visual thing. You gotta you gotta remember. You know, you you gotta get the parts across that that make it easier to translate it to a visual form. Oh yeah. Rather than yeah, a book. Yeah. Yeah, when when you're writing a screenplay, you're you're providing a blueprint for for someone else, and you don't need to describe what people are thinking because you can't film that. If someone's thinking something, they have to say or do something to reveal it, and you don't need to describe what it smells like in the room unless it matters. Because if it doesn't matter, you're not going to mention it anyways. Whereas in a book, you got to set the scene, you have to describe everything. And when I first started going from translating All Hallows Eve from the screenplay into the book, I was lucky that I at least had the plot all worked out because all of a sudden having to write what people are thinking and setting the scenes, setting the atmosphere. When you're doing a movie, you just rely on the director to do those things. You just yeah. need to write that it's gray and gloomy and they'll create that. Um, or If it smells like death, they'll say, someone will go, oh my God, it smells like death in here. It stinks in here, exactly, yeah. yeah. So, you know, nobody sits down and reads a screenplay for fun. They sit down and watch a movie. So you need to write down what people say and do, really, um, versus a book. Yeah, I mean, people sit down and, and that's what they enjoy. You're, you have to sell them on everything and put them in the place that you want them to be. And you can't rely on anybody else to do it. I mean, with a director, that's, you're providing a blueprint for them. And then they'll, they'll make changes on set based on uh, what's going on at the time and things they can't control, weather, etc. So, um, versus the book, you're, you're 100% in control. It's all you. Well, I want to thank you for coming on, man. Um, that, or got to wrap it up, you know, got to yeah. set up for the other show. So, yeah. <laughs> but where can people follow you if they want to? I'm on Facebook. It's a uh, Michael Penning author on Facebook. I'm on Twitter now. I just did my first tweet today. I've got a total of one tweet, and then it was to, to talk about your awesome show tonight. Um, yeah, I'm on Twitter. That's N Penning Author. Um, that's about it. Yeah, you know, the usual stuff. Look for yeah. me around those places. Yeah, I had a blog that completely got dropped after I discovered how awesome it is to have a Facebook page. So, <laughs> yeah, it's around there. Social media is really different, man. I mean, you can have like one thing or you could have a billion, you know, depending on how hard you want to yeah, work. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. That's what I keep saying. I'm like, I got to get more money so I can hire an assistant just to run all this stuff for me. <laughs> you know, I'm writing about your writing and actually doing your writing that you're supposed to do. Yeah. Well, thank you again. With that, I'm the 13th Wolfman and I'm on the prowl. <laughs>